Numbers chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible tells us, And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it. And His anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them, and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. And He called the name of the place Tibera, because the fire of the Lord burnt among them. Father, I pray that you'd help us tonight as we look at these uh, few verses to consider, Lord, what you have for us. May we uh, take the counsel that is given to us uh, from this, and I pray that you'd help us uh, here this evening, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The time for the children of Israel had come to move. We saw this a couple weeks ago as we were looking at the end of chapter number 10. And uh, they were moving on from uh, that place where they had received the law. They were moved from that place, that blessed place called Sinai. Uh, God's presence was very evident upon the mountaintop. But uh, God did not intend for His people to stay there. He had a place for them. He had a, a promised land that He was wanting to take them to. And so uh, after about 11 months, of being still. It was time to uh, pack things up and to begin to make the move. They've received the stone tablets that, uh, with the uh, Ten Commandments. They've received the other laws that were necessary. They've built the tabernacle. I mean, they've got all these wonderful things now, uh, but now it's time to get moving once again. And we know that, uh, you know, You've sat around for a while, and you to get time where you have to get moving. Sometimes it doesn't go so well. Um, you know, some of you that work out, or uh, maybe you're a runner, or something like that. You know that uh, if you lay the dumbbells aside for a couple of weeks, or if you don't uh, make that run for a couple of weeks, or do some things, uh, and all of a sudden you decide I'm going to get back to it, and you get out there, and you think you can just pick up where you left off. That's not so. Um, that first workout, that first run, you are feeling quite the, um, uh, you're feeling things you didn't know you had. Let's just put it that way. Uh, there are things that are sore that were, have not been sore, and it's just part of that inactivity that causes that to happen. And, and you know, that's, that's kind of where the church was here just a few years ago, were we not? Uh, the COVID shutdown, it, it caused a lot of problems for us. All of a sudden, uh, people uh, got used to being uh, at home and watching a live stream service in their pajamas and eating their Fruit Loops. And, you know, they kind of like that a little bit. And, uh, you know, there are still those today. Here it is. It's four years later. They're still not going to church. Uh, they're still uh, sitting at home and, and watching the live stream. But even those who have returned to church, they've not picked up the tools of the ministry. Now they've, they haven't gotten back to work. The, the track racks remain full. Where at one time you were having to refill those things every, every several weeks uh, there, and you know, uh, having to keep a supply in, the, uh, the bus route still sits silent. Now there are those who still have not uh, resumed their bus routes. Uh, not because they can't, it's just they can't find anybody willing to get out because, well, you know, we just we kind of got used to this. Inact inactivity does that. Sunday school classes are understaffed. Uh, nurseries lack workers. Uh, doors remain unknocked all over town. Why is it? Because there was inactivity for a while. And we got used to the inactivity. We got used to just sitting back and, and doing nothing and, and just kind of uh, just milling around. And, and we kind of found out we kind of like that. We kind of like being comfortable, and, and that, that's where, uh, you know, things ha have gotten here, and, and they, they got used to just kind of uh, just sitting around, and, you know, just uh, every morning you get up, and you have your cup of coffee, and your, uh, your manna cakes there, and you just sit there and just have a good time, and do whatever you do around the place, and get the next morning, everything the same. Now, all of a sudden, you had to get up, you had to pack things up. You had to start walking down the, uh, the road again, and, and it wasn't an easy road to be walking down either. It was a difficult uh, uh, way that God was leading them. And so you, you, that, that first day, maybe after you walked a little bit, they were a little sore and thought, well, it's okay, it'll work itself out. But it's three days now. That is all. It's three days. And what do the people of Israel begin doing? Well, they do what they're best at. They murmur. They complain. Why'd you bring us out here? What's all this about? 
And it's interesting here, the Lord just summarizes things here for us in the first three verses, and we're just going to look at those few verses tonight. In the uh, weeks to come, we'll look at the following verses and see where uh, what the, the complaint was all about. But let's just look here real quick tonight and consider the murmuring that was going on in the camp. The murmuring that was going on in the camp. You know, the Bible tells us that God has placed all of these things in His Word for us to be an ensample. It's for us to look back at and take some learning from. It's for us to look at and say, don't follow this here. Don't do these things. Some things we're supposed to follow, but there's a lot in here that we're not supposed to do. This is one of those areas of uh, here that God is, is a desire is for His people to go forward and for His people to do something and be active in His work and to be serving Him. You know that is the whole reason we're here. You're not here to become a millionaire. You're not here to have uh, lands and toys and, and all those other things. We're here to serve the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And, and if we're not careful, we get distracted and we get caught up in all these other things that we forget what we're supposed to do. God says, I want a people that are going to serve me. And, and one of those things is that we pack up and we move forward for the cause of Christ. And, and this is exactly what God had his people to do. It's time to pack up and move forward. But then the Bible says, and when the people complained... The people began to complain. This was that identifying character trait of these people here from the time, think about it, from the time Moses came to them and he showed up the first time. They have been complaining about everything. Oh, you're making life harder on us because Pharaoh's increasing our, our burdens. And truly he did, but man, God had a plan. God was trying to do something, but they didn't see it. And so uh, there they are. And then it's time to leave. And they, they head out. And, and I mean, it's not just, I mean, they're not gone maybe a, a day or two and Pharaoh's behind them. Oh, you brought us out here to kill us. There weren't enough graves in Egypt. They get across the Red Sea after an amazing crossing, after an amazing uh, thing that God does uh, for them and brings them across. And there they are on the other side and they come uh, to that place uh, of, of Mara and they find themselves in a place where there was bitter water. Oh, you brought us out here to kill us. A few days later, we're hungry. You brought us out here to kill us. Man, it rains down from heaven. Go a few more days and there's, uh, they don't have water. Oh, you brought us out here to kill us. We don't like you, Moses. You don't like us and we don't like you. Moses strikes the rock and the water gushes out of the rock. Time and time and time again, they complain, they complain, they complain to the point to where God said, I'm done. Moses, take your people and go. Yeah. Moses like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. These are not my people. These are your people. They had a little argument back and forth. And there was, a, uh, there was something that was, uh, there was a, a goddess. He talked to them and he, he gave them these things here. Uh, boy, uh, he was really trying to get them to, to get on board. Of course, we know that there was a, God said, I'll, I'll go with you uh, there. And he made, a, he made a decision to go with the people of Israel and to go with, uh, with Moses. But can you just see this here about these folks? It's all they do is complain, complain, complain. May God deliver us from a complaining spirit. That every little thing, oh, I stubbed my toe. God must hate me. No, you just need to open your eyes better. You know, everything God isn't judging on everything. Boy, you know, we, we need to be careful. Sometimes the Lord allows some things in uh, here. I'm amazed here when you think about this here in verse 33, we're told that they, they've gone three days journey and they've just begun complaining. It didn't take long to leave the place of blessing before they got all, uh, all bitter again. You know, it's kind of like this here. We just finished up missions conference this last Sunday. And I mean, oh, man, it was a great day. And boy, we were, we were excited about everything else. But you know how long it's been since we've had missions conference? It's been three days. Anything happened to you over the last three days? Anything that got into your life that caused you to get a little bitter? Anything that's come along in the last three days has caused you to maybe complain a little bit. Just a few days ago, you were rejoicing in how good God is and all the wonderful things that He has. And, and boy, look at these folks who are going to the mission field. Man, we were stirred. We were, we were excited about things. But here it is. It's three days later. It happens fast, doesn't it? 
Well, we've got to guard ourselves. We've got to guard our spirit and understand here that one of the greatest dangers in the Christian life is coming off that mountaintop experience. We're vulnerable. We're vulnerable as we're, we're coming back down to the, uh, to the place of our regular journey uh, here. And we've got to protect ourselves against that because, listen, Satan is looking for an opportunity to come in and give you reason to complain. You know what a complaint is? It's telling God he's not good. That's what complaining is. Complaining is saying, God, you're not good to me. God, you're not true to your word. Uh, God, you're not, a, uh, you're, not, you're not faithful to me. That's what you're saying. You're saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. That's not a life of faith. That's not a life that looks to God and trusts Him with everything He's allowed into our lives. But listen, we got to guard again. I'm not saying that you don't go to God and tell Him the, the things that are going on. That's who, the only person you should be going to, really, is just saying, God, you know what's going on in my life. And you pour out, as David said, you pour out your complaint to the Lord. You know, it's okay to pour out your complaint to the Lord. He wants to hear him. Give it to him. Let him take care of those things. But listen, we've got to be careful that we, we don't fall into a complaining spirit where we become sour about everything. And boy, you know, all, every, uh, the whole world's a mess and everything's terrible, terrible, terrible. No, it's not. God's been good. God's a good God. You know, I, I think of this here. I, uh, my wife and her family is going through a very difficult time as they're uh, saying goodbye to their, their dad. But you know, as hard as it is on this side of things, the same time there's joy in the heart because of the hope of heaven. No matter how bad, no matter how much uh, he's got to go through before he makes that cross. And you understand he's getting a perfectly brand new body from the Lord. And he's not going to have a single pain at all. And the, and, and the, and the Lord that he has lived for uh, these last 30, 40 years of his life, uh, that, that Lord, 50 years of his life, that Lord that he's lived for, uh, he's about to see him face to face. You know, God's good. Even in the midst of sorrow, God's good. I, I love 1 Thessalonians 4. We sorrow, but not as those who have no hope. But that, you know, God, God can, can, uh, can just take those, those, those things that are on us. It's interesting that you, uh, you get to Deuteronomy where Moses begins to rehearse some things with the people there. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 19, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 15, this path they have been on for three days. All we read is they've been on a path for three days, but you do a little research. It is not a fun place. In fact, Moses calls it in Deuteronomy, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that great and terrible wilderness. So it, it's not like it's an easy place, but it's a place you need to learn to trust God no matter what the problems are. Uh, though that This area here that they are walking through these few days is characterized by mountains and deep gorges and, and desert and, and fiery serpents and scorpions, uh, according to chapter 8 and verse 15. You don't understand what a fiery serpent is, right? It's a poisonous snake. Scorpions, I, I mean, as they're walking through, there's these things all over. And they, they're seeing these things, and they're getting, they're getting a little aggravated with God. What, what, what are you doing uh, bringing us along this way here? Well, uh, God, Moses, why are you bringing us out this way? Uh, uh, isn't there a better way to go? Isn't, oh, why do we have to go up that big hill? Oh, why do we have to go so far down? Oh, it's so dry out here. It's so hot. Oh, Moses. Moses, I found a scorpion in my, in my sleeping bag this morning when I woke up. Things all over the place. What could possibly keep them from complaining? The trust and their faithful, loving God that He knew the best path that He had, not led them astray. We've got to remind ourselves of that. Pastor, you don't understand that of the, the difficulties we're going through. You don't understand the, uh, the, uh, the, the problems we're dealing with. Can I ask you this here? Are you, are you right with the Lord? If you're right with the Lord, can I tell you, it is not a mistake. It is not God has, uh, has left you, but He is being faithful to you. He's just trying to guide you through to teach you to trust Him even more. Are we trusted Him? 
I want you to see this as well. We've seen this several times here, the people of Israel complain. But in this case here, notice what the Bible says there in verse 1. It displeased the Lord. It displeased the Lord. How many in here think that complaining is a, a, a sin? Okay. All right. Seven of you do. <clears throat> How many of you think that complaining is right up there with murder and adultery and all sorts of immorality? How many would put it on that level of sin? Okay. That was even fewer hands up on that one. <clears throat> that word displease is very interesting. That word displeasure means to be evil. In other words, what it's saying there is that God thinks this, that this, this sin of complaining is just as evil as every other sin that you can think of. He puts it on the same level. Oh, it's not as bad as murder now. According to God it is. That word, it displeased the Lord, means that the Lord thought this is evil. He doesn't say that a lot about, about a lot of sins. But in this one here, he said, that is evil. Our Lord does not like it when we complain because it's a shot at Him. It, 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 it takes a shot and says, well, our, our God is not as good as He is. I want us to, uh, to understand here that the Lord was displeased with this here because what, what we often, what we wink at, God often is greatly displeased with. Well, it's not that big of a deal. God says, oh, it's a big deal. I don't appreciate it. I want you to think about this here that we find out also. He says it, it displeased the Lord. And notice here, the Lord heard it. You go complaining there in your bedroom. You go into your private place and you think you can uh, go over there and nobody else hears it. God hears it. He's listening. Hey, God hears it. Uh, you know, God hears everything. He hears everything that comes out of this mouth. By the way, He hears your thoughts too. You may not say it, but He knows what you're thinking. Yeah. Notice there, the Bible says, It displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and His anger was kindled. In spite of His blessings, they complained. In spite of His blessings, they uh, begin to moan and groan about everything. That, that, that idea of kindling there is, is to stir up. It's like when you get that fire started out there and you've got, the, you've got the big pieces of wood laying there, but you just can't throw a match on there. Expect the, the logs to get burning, can you? So what do you do? You go around and you pick up some kindling. And you throw that in there so you can get that fire burning so it'll get good and hot. That's exactly what they've done. They have come to God's anger and they've taken some kindling underneath there and they've thrown that in there and they set a match to it and they have lit a fire. A fire that they did not want to light. But because of their complaint, and that's exactly the picture that God needs uh, to, God has given to us there. We understand, listen, there needs to be a holy anger towards sin, but notice it needs to be a, a holy anger towards sin in our own lives. Uh, we're good at pointing out everybody else's sin and being upset about that. But listen, we need to get right with our God and we need to make sure that we're angry with our sin, the sin that does so easily beset us and, and, and have that same righteous, holy anger that God has uh, in our, uh, that, that we kind of covet or we kind of, we kind of cut along in our lives that we don't think it's a big deal. No, God, I know it's a sin, but it's not that big of a deal. God says it displeases me. A simple idea of complaint, and we see God's judgment. Notice there, and the fire of the Lord burned among them. There's no question this was not some freak of nature. You know, sometimes we hear about these wildfires that they have been down in Texas here recently, and some out in California and other places, and, and sometimes they start because of a lightning bolt. You know, everything is dry and there's a lightning bolt hits and all of a sudden there's this blaze and we've got this problem upon us here. And, or maybe, it's, uh, uh, maybe somebody throws out a, a cigarette butt, you know, and, they, and by throwing that out in that dry grass, all of a sudden it, it just lights up the, uh, the roadway. Uh, I remember one time that uh, uh, a couple of guys from this church, they were out dro driving down the uh, highway and they were shooting bottle rockets out their, uh, their car. And as they did, um, not thinking, imagine that, teenage guys, uh, not thinking as they're going down the 
road. They set the side of the road on fire out here, uh, out, in, out in Patterson there. And, and uh, the next thing you know, as they're driving in town, uh, here comes the fire trucks going the opposite direction. Like, I wonder what that's all about. And they turned around and found out it's where they shot bottle rockets out at. That's all explainable, isn't it? This was not that. This was the fire. Whose fire? Of the Lord. God made sure that we understood, I am dealing with their sin. It's the fire of the Lord. Boy, that's, that's something there that should, should cause us to uh, you know, just look at our own life and say, boy, uh, what in the world is going on here? Well, you know, you think about this here. God has heard complaining all over and over and over again, but He's never sent the fire of the Lord down. What's the difference? What made this time different than whenever they left out of Egypt? And they said, God, you brought us out here to kill us uh, at the Red Sea. Bro, God, you brought us out here to kill us at the waters of Mara. Uh, you, God, you brought us out here to kill us as they were in the wilderness there and they had no food. God, you brought us out here to kill us when the Amalekites came up. God, you brought us out here to kill us whenever they had no water and they finally had to come out of the rock. Why didn't God send the fire then? If you were to go back to Exodus 33, we looked at this here uh, before, but uh, God had promised that He would consume them in Exodus 33, verse 3, if they continued and they broke His, His, His laws. You see, before that, God was being gracious and trying to get them out, and He understood the, the discomfort and whatnot. But now, listen, uh, whenever He said, I'm not going to go with you, they said, no, God, we need you. He said, if I'm going to go with you, understand, when sin comes back in the camp, I will consume you. And they said, that's fine, God, we understand. Sin is in the camp now. Guess what God did? He didn't pass it off. He, didn't, he wasn't long-suffering. Listen, there's a limit to God's long-suffering. We're watching in this country. God has been patient. He's been long-suffering uh, towards America. But listen, I believe we have crossed over that line. And we're watching God uh, just begin to take away a lot of the stuff in this country. We're watching all these different things. Uh, you, you see this immigration issue that we're dealing with. And we're watching an overrun uh, of what's taking place. And we're watching uh, the moral fiber of our country just wear away. What is that all about? We've, we've embraced sin. We've embraced insanity. And what we are reaping is the judgment of God in this place. God always has a line. God always has a line. God's patience had reached its limit with Him. Remember in Genesis 6-3, the Bible tells that God's Spirit would not always strive with man. Is He the same yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah, of course He is. He says in Malachi 3, I am the Lord, I change not. Now listen, there's, there's problems there whenever sin is, a, is, a, is apparent. Now listen, uh, Israel had promised to keep His commands back in Exodus 19 and verse 8, but here they have chosen not to. Israel's privilege of knowledge demanded punishment. They knew better. Mom and dad, you're dealing with your kids and you have to discipline them. You ask them the question, did you know that you weren't supposed to do this? Did you know you were supposed to do that? And when they say yes, what is that an affirmation? That the discipline, the chastisement that's about to come is warranted. It's deserved because you knew what you were supposed to do and you chose not to. There's always consequences to the actions. And here God said, you knew and you chose not to obey. They knew more about God because of their encounter at Sinai. And with that privilege, there was a great responsibility to be obedient to it. Listen, privilege brings responsibility. Spiritual privilege demands improved behavior. And the severity of this underscores that, doesn't it? The Bible says that he, uh, even, in, even in his judgment, he was gracious. Notice there what the Bible says. The Lord, the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. He didn't start in the middle of the camp. 
He started on the outskirts. And even in that, he was gracious and merciful. It could have been a whole lot worse, but he chose to come in there. But I want you to see what the people chose to do in verse 2. And the people cried unto Moses, and Moses prayed unto the Lord. The fire was quenched. Now, wait a minute. We looked at all those other times of complaining. Who they complain against? Moses, you, God, you and God, you and God, you and God, you and God. Now they're coming to Moses saying, Moses! Would it, be a far, would it be much of a stretch to assume that when the Bible says in, the very, in that first verse, and when the people complained that something didn't come out like this here, well, that Moses... Is, would, that be, would that be fairly consistent? That Moses. I'm sure his name was not being extolled at that time as they were complaining. But isn't it amazing as soon as the judgment of God falls, who do they turn to? Moses! Moses often took the brunt of their complaints, but we find a man whenever they came to him, what did he do? People cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord. How many of you would have felt kind of like, hey, serves you right. You do the crime, you do the time. That wasn't Moses' attitude. No. Why was that? Because Moses was a man who walked with God. Because he was a man who walk, had walked with God, there was a man who was full of grace. You want to know if you're walking with the Lord or not? If you're in fellowship with Him, you deal with somebody uh, doing you dirty and all those other things. And whenever you have the opportunity to even the score, you choose grace. When Jesus hung on that cross, He could have called down 10,000 angels, but what did He do instead? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Grace. That's Christ-like right there. As being Christ-like. Moses, Moses, uh, uh, we're in trouble. Moses, the fire's burning. Moses, getting close to our tent. Moses, my family's in trouble. Moses, do something. And Moses prayed. Grace prays for the offenders. And aren't you glad for this here? Uh, Moses prayed unto the Lord. The fire was quenched. What I love about that is that whenever Moses prayed, he got an answer. You know when you're desperate and you need, you need something, you need an answer, you want to go to somebody, you want somebody praying for you, you want to know that whoever's praying for you can get an answer. You don't just want somebody who's going to throw up a, a, you know, a, a nickel prayer up to God and say, God, I hope, uh, just bless them, God, help them out. But rather you want somebody who's going to go to God, who's been walking with God, who, who's in fellowship with God, and, and who has the ear of God. And whenever they cry out to the Lord, Lord, uh, so-and-so needs your help, you know they're going to get an answer. We want people like that, don't we? You tell old brother Shear to pray for you. Yeah. You knew God was going to know. Yeah. You knew it. You tell, uh, I remember you used to have uh, uh, Dr. Tom Williams come through. You tell brother Williams that you had a, you had a need. You knew heaven was going to find out about it. And there are people in your life that you know that you could go to and you could pray, or ask them to pray, and you knew that it was settled. God was going to get the word and God would take care of things in his will. Moses prayed, and when he did, the fire was quenched. Moses had a right relationship with the Lord. And because of that, he could get his, answer, his prayers answered. One of the biggest helps we can have in our prayer life is a pure life. Being right with him. You see, whenever God saved us and brought us into the family, He gave us a permanent place in the family. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that when He gave us life, He gave us eternal life. Eternal life has no end. If God were to, to, uh, to save us today and tomorrow we messed up and He took that salvation away, it wouldn't be eternal life. But He gives us eternal life, and I'm thankful for that. But we can have this happen. We can lose the fellowship. Well, I'm still a son, but I can have no fellowship with my father. That's where David in Psalm 51, he said, uh, he, he said uh, to the Lord, he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. 
He didn't need a salvation restored. He needed the joy restored. That's that fellowship. That's that, that's that relationship. That's that walking with the Lord and, and knowing that whenever I'm talking to Him, He's hearing me. Uh, God, restore it. Well, how does that happen? By getting right with the Lord. Psalm 66 and verse 18, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Is there sin in your life tonight? Oh, maybe nobody else knows about it. Maybe it's, it's hidden away real nicely somewhere in the, in the corners of your heart that, and nobody else, not even your, your, your husband or your wife know about, not even your mom and dad know about it. It's, it's there deep inside of you, but I'll tell you, there's somebody who knows. And he won't give a listen to you until you get it right. What are some things we can take away tonight quickly? First off, let's be mindful of our attitude as we go through life. Let's be mindful of our attitude. Don't be a complainer. Don't get complain. Listen, it is easy to, to, uh, to, to find fault with everything that comes in life and to complain and to whine and to murmur. Uh, that word murmur is a, such an interesting word. Just, it's that under the breath stuff. You know, as you're walking, oh, I would never come back to this place again. That uh, kind of service I got around here, I'll tell you what, these people here, this, that, and that, that's murmuring. It's not loud enough for anybody else to hear, but God hears. Let's be careful. Let's, let's protect our attitude. Let's protect our spirit. Let's make sure that we stay right with God. Uh, secondly, tonight, can I just say this here? Our sin will always, it always, always, always displeases God. Always. There's never a time that God looks at us and says, well, that's just the way they are. We'll just let them go. This. No, your sin always displeases God. There's never a time that God is not displeased with us when we go into sin. He's never pleased when we choose to go against Him. Listen, He'll chastise us if we don't deal with it. Uh, why? Because we are His children. By the way, the Bible says if you are not chastised for your sin, that tells you something else. You are not one of His. You're an illegitimate son. Well, Pastor, I can do anything I want to, and God never bothers me one bit. I wouldn't brag about that. In fact, I'd run to the altar tonight and say, God, I need help. I need you to save my soul because you're not saved. He says so in the book of James, says, you're not one of mine. But we need to make sure that we're careful uh, concerning that. But thirdly, tonight and lastly, is this here, let's be the kind of people that folks know they can come to when a prayer needs to be answered. That's just not for the pastor to do. That's not just for the deacon to do. That's just not for the Sunday school teacher. That should be every single one of us in this room. That's when somebody needs something gotten to God, they know they can come to you, they can come to me and say, would you pray? And when they walk away and they know you're praying, they know God knows. But that takes constant work. That takes constant vigilance on our part to look around and make sure that sin does not find a place in our life, that sin doesn't find a, a harbor there for us where we, we coddle it and we cover it. And when nobody knows about it, no, we've got to be sure that we look for our sin and we get it taken care of, we get it uprooted and we get it right with God because be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Let's be the kind of people that people can come to and say, I need you to pray. And when they walk away, there's a confidence that God hears our prayers. Let's make sure we stay in fellowship with Him all along the way. It's a warning passage. It's a warning passage. They complained, it displeased the Lord. You complain, you go into sin, it displeases the Lord. But oh, I'm so thankful that as the judgment of God fell, there was a man who could call upon the name of the Lord. And when he did, the fire ceased. Because there was a man who was in fellowship with the Lord. Father, help us tonight.